Welcome to another episode of the Coffee Roaster Warm Sessions podcast. Friends, thank you for joining us once again on another episode. This is episode, I think, 106 or 107, um, which is beautiful. Uh, but yeah, let's just get into this. Let's pour some batchy. It's cooling down already, um, and I want to give this give this little taste to see, see what's in here. Your intros are uh, definitely way more energetic than mine. Dude, my my intro in the last episode was very uh, dull. It was very uh, felt scripted. Felt like felt like I was reading an audio book and not a podcast. I mean that's fine. I guess nothing not wrong really. with it. I don't like it. That's a solid brew. It's great. Honestly, yeah, yeah. I brewed this coffee on filter this morning. That's fun. It was better on filter this morning, but this is, but the extraction, I don't know what we're doing, but it's, these batches have been great. Started using the cone and I started going was, way finer. Do you think that's the game changer? Dude, it's the conus. I'm telling you, I started going also very fine, reduced really? the dose. How um, much did you do? Not 50, 50 to 800. No, 50 is what we 50 were 50 is what we were doing? No. Oh, at home I do 60 yeah, to 1,000. Yeah. Okay, no, okay. 50, yeah. 50, yeah. Wow. So it was in the basket. It was in the cone attachment. Somebody mm-hmm. asked me on Instagram, was like, do you guys always use the Breville Brewer on the pod? Mm. Can you give me your recipe? So I said, hey, sometimes we use the flat bottom. Sometimes we, we use the cone. So if you're listening to this, Luke, the verdict, I guess, is what? The cone's better? I don't know. Maybe. I just don't like the build of the Breville basket. Yeah. Because the cone sits and there's that gap of yeah. air that gets... I don't know. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe you should just watch Lance Hedrick's video breaking it down. I don't know. You do you. Honestly, this is a tasty brew. Yeah. This is really tasty. This is honestly like a solid. I'm getting some maybe like chocolate, toffee. Some like stone fruit, not plum, not cherry, but something else. Yeah, definitely stone fruit. Actually, less toffee and chocolate than I'm than I initially thought. Yeah, it's Actually, more acidity. it's a little more zingy, mm-hmm. um, like on the acidity, which yeah. makes sense because this is our this is our co- this is the coffee we dropped last week, um, or earlier this week on Monday. Actually, mm-hmm. uh, it's the Guatemala. It's a Guatemala from Huehue Tenango by I think I'm gonna mispronounce his name, and I'm sorry, Itail Vasquez. Vasquez, Vasquez, yeah. Uh, he runs the farm, uh, I think, La Intelligentsia, mm-hmm. which is, um, a, if you've had coffee, a Guatemalan coffee um, from some, like, major, bigger brands, they've had them, like, Canberra served their coffee, mm-hmm. um, a lot of other bigger companies have, so um, he's, he's he's fairly fairly well-known, but yeah. we, we just dropped this coffee, Um Drinking this right now, and I think this is the, res- I think this is the response. Be like behind putting flavor notes on a bag. At the end of the day, flavor notes are not meant to. It's not a competition. Yeah. It's not you know who who can put the craziest flavor notes or who can pick out the flavor notes the best. Even though there's some of that that needs to be there because where I was going with this is flavor notes are meant to give you a depiction of what you should expect out of the coffee, like yeah. a ballpark mm-hmm. so that you can make a better buying decision. This isn't about who's the, you know, this isn't some kind of flavor note competition, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. And so tasting this, tell the folks, who do you think this coffee is for? At the end of the day, yeah. as a roaster, I think it's actually really important to say this coffee is for X, Y, and Z. Yeah. These are the people who will enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, the backstory is basically this coffee is part of what we wanted to create on our menu throughout the year. And that's to have a solid Guatemalan. Mm-hmm. Uh, we said that from day one, we wanted a coffee that was not only approachable, but still like fun for us, for you and I to drink, but also easy for anyone to grab and basically say, I'm going to brew this on espresso. I'm going to brew this on filter. I'm going to brew this on batch and I'm probably going to win. Um, yes. So that's why I think this coffee is a people pleaser from that perspective. It's it'll be acceptable on your dinner dinner like room table or uh, on your dinner table for post dinner sweets. 
it's going to be a great treat, but it's also going to be a good way to wake up in the morning knowing that you're going to have something that's easy to drink, enjoyable, and completely solid. Serge, are you now doing coffee pairings with food now? I mean, sometimes that's part of my job description in the cafe, so, sometimes. Word on the street is, I guess, according to Sergi, uh, this is a dinner coffee. Uh, I guess. I mean, what defines <laughs> a dinner coffee? That's kind know. of like, when I think dinner, yeah, I think fun. of it's fun. whenever we have family gatherings at your place, yeah. we're usually brewing a cup of coffee, like post-dinner, like right before the sweets. I, to be Crown honest, a little pie. I don't know if that's a normal thing. I oh, like okay. It. I, I don't, I'm like, that's for me. No, no, no. Yeah. no. I like oh, yeah. it. I'm. I was just thinking about it when you were saying. It. I'm like, uh, folks, do you like people listening to this? Like, do you drink coffee like after a meal? Like, especially at home? Like when you get when you guys are just sitting around, or are you guys on to more adult beverages or what? Yeah. <laughs> I guess <laughs> like, fair enough. Like yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I'm a. I mean, I'm a huge fan of this. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. You have a meal and then you can brew up some batch. Everybody can share and enjoy it. I think it's killer. Yeah, I think it's fun. I mean, yeah. it reminds me. I, I think part of it is also because like we're, we're quote unquote foreigners or like people with a different culture. Fair. And for us, it's Fair. very cultural to do this. Like yeah. this is a almost like a cultural statement. I remember even Edwin sharing that they would drink coffee from morning to like sundown. Right, where right. majority of the time in the United States, like coffee in the evening is like decaf or nothing. Yes, and morning it's like ultimately you have to get caffeinated. Yes, and um, yeah. Speaking of culture, like we grew up where tea is like a staple. Like mm -hmm. you're drinking tea almost the, any part of the day, any time. You just need something to sip on to chill around, to talk around, it's tea. Like, let's bring out the tea. It's like 11 p.m. You're not even asking for a decaf tea. It's yeah, just tea. Yeah. It's just whatever it is. Yeah, and it's not iced tea. Yeah, like, I think yeah. it's so common in the yeah. United States to get, like, especially when I lived in the South, mm -hmm. iced tea, sweet tea is, like, common. Um, but this is, like, piping hot tea, like, midsummer, uh, winter. Yeah. Like, anytime it's piping hot tea. It's legit. That reminds me of when I was in India, man, 100% mm. humidity mm. and they're just boiling up some tea for you. It's like night, like high 80s, low 90s, 100% humidity, 100. I don't even know what that means. And you're just <laughs> swimming. Whoo. And they're like, dude, it, that's great. If you drink something hotter, you'll actually cool down. I'm yeah. like, like, I don't know how that works. <laughs> it's hot right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. So, totally. but I, I mean, I would agree. Um, this coffee fits under our, uh, our timeless series, which our timeless, uh, series or identifier is for coffees that are, have a lot of familiarity. They're people pleasers, but we're not forsaking simply just getting something right. boring. We still want something that both you and I enjoy. Mm -hmm. We like something that's going to give a little bit of complexity, a little nuance, something that's going to actually be something interesting to sip on. I um, mean, it's not just bland and dull. So I think this fits it really well. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just uh, it's just a banger all around, just very universal, so to speak. Right. And um, yeah, it's... It's a it's pretty heavy on being a daily driver. Yeah, so for sure, that's that's it, folks. Grab a bag. A hundred. I mean, a hundred percent recommend. Like ten out of ten should grab a bag. So I'm super stoked for this coffee to be uh, in cafes. All of our wholesale partners, um, especially like folks in Bellingham, like snagging a bag. Like I'm excited to hear the feedback. Yeah, yeah. I, I, honestly, as it cools. The acidity kind of pops out a little more. Um, mm -hmm. I'm getting a little more kind of cherry. That stone fruit starts to kind of come through a little bit. Um, it's not actually, it's not as much chocolate. Not mm -hmm. as much. I think I was very wrong. There's like an element of almost, I always say grape. I'm tired of saying grape, but it's something like, yeah. uh, man, is it gooseberry? No, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had to throw that in. That's great. That's There's great. no we gooseberry. Need, we, need, in here. we need a gooseberry coffee. We, we need, need a gooseberry a episode. Goose. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> Bring the elephant bean back, but the gooseberry bean. <laughs> Alrighty. Speaking of drinking coffee um, at home, uh, to kick this off, I just want to say, like, uh, 
You just had a really interesting encounter at yeah, the cafe. That was, that was Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. Basically, like, slow morning, you know, I sometimes love slow mornings in the cafe. They're so fun. I get to interact with guests more. And that's how this happened. Like, this guy just pops into the cafe and never met him, don't know him, can't recognize him, nothing. Like, a gentleman that's definitely uh, upwards of, you know, over half of his life has been lived. Let's just say that kindly. Um, but he had this nice, like, uh, pep in his step, like excitement was looking at the bags. And I, as soon as I noticed curiosity like that, I'm like, sweet, there's going to be some kind of good convo going here. And because I had the time just started asking him questions, like, and his order was, uh, cortados. And I was like, well, that's fun. I'm like, you want some wild espresso? Like, you know, having that and kicked off just talking about brewing coffee at home. And he went on raving like raving about his setup and i was like huh like you're getting such tasty coffee at home like you know what are you doing here like and he ended up telling me that he has like a slayer like the like slayers are not cheap home machines yeah like the cream of the crop slayer he has a monolith and he has a weber eg1 like he had all of them and then he had some smaller grinders like ah you know not worth even mentioning. So he had like multiple grinders, espresso machine, quite the setup. And I was like completely appalled, especially because it's not someone our age, not someone who's like right. the Reddit home barista. This is just someone who wants a tasty beverage and decided to have this. <laughs> just uh, wants. <laughs> I mean, basically sound like it. And he's like, ah, the Weber, dude. He's like, do you have the Unifilter? I was like, I do. And we started chatting about the Unifilter nice. um, and stuff like that. So, cool. um, but anyway, he um, ended up also at the end mentioning that um, I'm not going to drop any names, folks. Not not saying anything here. But he was quite a famous uh, outdoor CEO of some pretty big international right. outdoor company. Right. Um, so to me, the whole element that he was from out of town, um, he found narrative, he makes tasty coffee at home, but he also goes into a cafe and with like a lot of hype not to buy coffee beans but to have a beverage so all of that is like really intrigued me because you and i like again we own a roasting company we visit a bunch of cafes we don't just drink our own coffee yeah you brew a lot you you have quite the setup you have an ek in your office i have a taste i i have a batch brewer i have a decked out uh Right. Well, what's the lever machine? Why well, I'm a flare. Yeah. You know, I I have fun gadgets, but I'm always going to cafes. You know. Um. So I just that whole concept I think is very interesting. And we did a whole episode on this right not long ago. Um. So we don't want to keep repeating this whole conversation, but I think there's something interesting about how you know, what you enjoy doing at home when that gets transferred also into um, like coffee tourism. Yep. It becomes such a big part of your travel as well. And so this guy I'm assuming is probably out of town. Oh yeah, right? I forgot to mention yeah. he's from Vancouver, BC. He was from Vancouver. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. And I, actually, you know, speaking of Vancouver, we go up there all the time. Yeah. We literally, we've done multiple competitions up there. Um uh, you probably go into the pallet coffee roasters that throw down. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. When's yeah. that happening? That's uh so, shout out to June. That's happening by uh June. Oh, June on June at twenty fourth. Yeah. Twenty fourth. Yeah. Oops. I'll okay. get all the Junes okay. mixed up. Yeah. yeah. Um and so we go up there all the time. And actually, uh the cra- the funniest thing ever is like going through the border and the border patrol is always like steel manning like poker face like what are you going up to vancouver for you're just like hey i'm going up there to just get a cup of coffee they're like <laughs> you're driving an hour to get a cup of coffee like and it's always super suspicious to them yeah. so i always have to back it up like dude dude don't worry about it hey yeah. i own a coffee roasting exactly company. And you always like, say that they're like <laughs> and then you can see like they chill out they kind of understand not me and then, i never back down yeah <laughs> I have to because I've been pulled over too many times. I'm done dealing with that. (laughs) And so, um, so yeah, oftentimes you say that, but then even then after you say, they're like, what, what, what's special about, you know, Vancouver coffee. And Mm -hmm. to be honest, I think Vancouver has one of the best scenes 
Uh, maybe in, for sure in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. West Coast. I don't. I don't know. Um, but it's it's pretty killer. But that being said, like, we'll actually drive, yeah. like, lengths of time to go visit cafes to try new uh, roasters, coffee shops, whatever it is. People doing like a pop up stand. Yeah. We'll go. That's always fun, you know. And so, actually, coffee has literally just shifted and changed. Not yep. only how we brew, I mean, this like coffee enthusiasm is like not only ha- changed how we brew, but it also changes how we travel. A hundred percent. Like we literally, I mean, also going on right here, um, I'm going to Los Angeles in like a couple of weeks uh, just for, for a quick little weekend trip. And literally we're planning our Airbnb around where the cafes are. Mm-hmm. I literally put a guide in Apple Maps, uh, like an LA coffee guide. And you can click on the guide and it'll show you all the locations where yep. uh, the coffee shops are. Whether I, We literally chose our Airbnb to be at, in the general direction of where the yeah. biggest cluster is. Yeah, uh, 100%. I did that with Gerald back in the day. Um, when was this? Like 20, maybe 18. Gerald and I living in Jacksonville, Florida, we just packed our bags and went to, out of all places chattanooga tennessee because we looked at all of the possible coffee stops we can make and we said hey if we hit up nashville and then stay in chattanooga we'll hit up all the coffee spots that we want to hit that we've heard about like we literally went to the grand opening or the soft opening of stay golden and now they're a fairly prominent roasting company in tennessee like we went to some i mean basically the whole point is we planned out a trip not because like we needed to go do something and grab coffee, not because there was an event that we went to, but because we said, hey, we want to go to these places because they have these cafes, which is mind boggling. I don't know if that's normal. Yeah. I mean, I guess I think maybe in the enthusiasm, like this is the cool thing, not just with coffee. I'm going to say like with everything, I'm pretty sure mm-hmm. people do that with wine. Like there's a reason why they go to wine country or you know, down in, uh, I had a buddy who just went and had like a weekend at, stayed at a vineyard. Oh, yeah. Um, and he's not like a crazy wine enthusiast, but it was like, it was like a thing you can do. Um, I'm sure like people do that with other things, but it's cool that I think this is like a real thing with coffee yeah. where people are now actually, I mean, the, my first itinerary anywhere to when I'm going somewhere, I'm looking up coffee spots. Yeah. And so, um, also like, but going back maybe eight years, maybe, uh, this is the crazy thing is that, um, we took with our, uh, some of our friends, we took a road trip from, uh, Portland to, uh, Minneapolis and it's crazy because it was a little challenging to find cafes. Um, but I think that was back then. I think now it's become so popular where like specialty coffee shops who are, roasting like kind of on the lighter side of the spectrum um i think it's actually becoming way more popular like you Mm -hmm. can run into some bangers out in town out in the middle of nowhere and it's going to be tasty yeah i think it's wild that people would you know come up to bellingham or come down to bellingham to do a coffee crawl like we're not a big town i think what our total population is slightly over 120k like we're not i mean slightly over a hundred yeah, and that and that's yeah. like majority of the cafes are in like central Bellingham, like downtown area. So it's like it's completely mind boggling that people would schedule their day, their Airbnbs, all of that just to stay in that. But I think when you brought up the whole idea of like vineyards, it made it brought this thought to my mind. Will it ever be common for people to enjoy coffee so much? That, for example, they go on vacation to Diego Bermuda's farm. I mean, I think that's something we talked about before with the potential NFT project. Yeah. Um, which I think would, it's it's still a thing. It's, you know, just a matter of time. But I think it's already has. I mean, when you talk about um, just maybe not on the level that you and I probably would, would want it to be. But for example, like if you go to Hawaii, I know a lot of people, you can schedule like a coffee tour. Right. That's a big thing. I mean, when you go to Bali, 
or when you yeah. go to Indo, Indo yeah. uh, it has a lot. There's a lot of that kind of influence. I know people who visit like these farms and they get these exquisite like coffee tasting experiences and all this stuff. Um, um, yeah, but I, but it's probably not as much as I think maybe I'd like it to see. Mm -hmm. um, but touring like something like Dago Bermuda, like even just taking like a one day trip out there yeah. would be crazy or like be crazy to visit like Alita state or something yeah. like that's, that'd be bonkers. But yeah, I, th I think that's a, that's a very interesting point. Yeah. What if there was a sense of like, not only because we talk about origin trips, right. And those are not, those are more or less business trips. They're not, um, we're not necessarily going for tourism. You know, yeah, we, yeah. especially as owners of a roasting company, we have a whole different perspective when we go to origin. Yes. Um, I'll be going to Indo and my perspective is going to be completely different than even if you went there for the first time or if mm -hmm. someone else that likes coffee went to Indonesia and stumbled to, you know, Taylor's Cafe. For sure. Like way different perspective. Um, but with that said, I'm like, I'm super intrigued about that idea that if, I, if tourism is growing to consume coffee, how far can we take that? And mm -hmm. if we do take that to the level of origin, could it potentially be healthy? Or because my, my initial thought is mm -hmm. that can't be healthy. Is that even good? But I'm like, but it kind of sounds like this could benefit producers. This could benefit farmers. Probably not all producers. We're also talking about very small yeah. niche yes, of producers. Niche. Like we got to bring that yes. up too. But the reality is like, could there be the sector within coffee that's like heavy on the tourism? Yeah. Could be. I don't know. I mean, that's, yeah. That No, it, when you were saying that, I was also like, I don't know if that's, maybe that can be good in some ways. Maybe that could be bad in the other ways. But it'd be also like a very select because, uh, a lot of these, you know, farms or producers that we're talking about, a lot of them actually don't, are not that big. Like, of course, I'm not talking about everyone, but mm -hmm. um, I mean, a lot of the people that we, even we work with, like Jorge Mendez, um, it's not a massive, like this behemoth, you know, of a of infrastructure and right. system. Um, but it's also, not to say it's, it's very small. No, it's, it's actually like a good chunk. Yeah. But uh but yeah, that's that's very interesting. I can, I can see it both being good and maybe to a certain extent maybe bad, but I'm an optimist, so I think like, man, yeah. Could th this could be something a little bit more, you know, for a select group of producers, this could be a little more financially beneficial. Yeah. Um for sure, I think uh raising the awareness of coffee drinkers is always a good idea. Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest reason why we have some of the issues that we have right now in the coffee industry is because just lack of awareness. It's not because yeah. people hate coffee farmers because they just don't oftentimes don't even know. Right. Like, even if you talk to, you know, some people who like specialty coffee, like even they don't know. And that's not to their fault. It's just right. simply because it hasn't been communicated in a way that makes sense to them. So in that sense, I'm like, yeah, I think raising the awareness of bringing that experience a little closer to home, I think has some impact. Yeah. You know, I think that happens also um, I across the board everywhere. It's like, you know, for me with like video making, it's like if I were to go to, you know, South by Southwest or if right. I were to go to specific events or experiences, like when you have those events and experiences actually brings this so much closer yeah. and you can take that with you all of a sudden the cup of coffee doesn't look the yeah. same actually that's you know a really you know crazy experience that you have when you go to origin for the first time right so. yeah yeah i have two thoughts first one is it reminded me of what taylor is doing in indo because he is actually using coffee as one way to invite people to stay at rinjani lighthouse mm -hmm. that is one of the things he advertises like you know grown here roasted here and served here at Rinjani Lighthouse. Yeah. And because majority or the big part of his demographic is mm -hmm. from um, Australia, they get it and why that's important. So he gets to do that. And it makes me think that that version, that the fact that people are not only drinking coffee that was grown, roasted, and that stayed in the country, because we all know that part of sustainability is not to export all your coffee, is to find the right person for that coffee within 
the actual uh, place of origin. Right. So he's keeping the coffee there. He's also using it as a way to market that place. So bring more people. Mm -hmm. I mean, what that is doing to the economics of that village, how that's providing more jobs. So if more people stay, they're going to need more yes. beds made. That means uh, more people need to do the laundry. He can possibly hire more people to do housekeep. Like that just explodes. So there's this idea of, in my mind, that sustainability doesn't always have to look like paying for more for coffee. Well, that's an important part. Don't get me wrong. But I'm saying there are other means of creating yes. sustainable markets and sustainable businesses for producers that may be similar to the tours. Yes. Any comment on that? Because I have another idea. But get back to me. Uh, as long as you just don't forget your what you were going to say. But yeah. I think 100%. I actually don't think that we talk uh, enough about, even on this podcast, about the sustainability aspects that don't that are outside of just paying more. Right. Outside of just saying, well, I... You know, I see this transparency report or, hey, they're paying five bucks a pound, six, seven bucks a pound, FOB, you know, must be good, even though it's not so cut and dry even then. Mm -hmm. But there are other ways that we can actually, and this is kind of getting into nerdy into like economics, but there are definitely other ways to make things work out for their better. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's very smart. But also something you said, um, I mean, oh, sorry, this is what I was going to say. Uh, that's actually a part of the reason why a lot of farmers actually grow like oranges, bananas, right. all these other things exactly. is because they're, they're be trying to be as multifaceted as possible mm -hmm. so that they can be a little more sustainable so that they can grow coffee instead of solely w putting your eggs in one basket, which is right. coffee, you know? Anyways. Yeah. A hundred percent. The other thought is we went to SCA and the reality is SCA events really impact the local cafes. Like for some cafes, when SCA is in town, when the expo is happening, when even Coffee Fest, that cafe may blow up for that weekend. Just sales will go out the roof. Like mm -hmm. So we already know that that version of tourism yes. also has a very deep economic impact on a cafe in yes. even the local city. Like if 10,000 people show up for right. this event, it's impactful. And I know like there is SCA, I know there's Coffee Fest, but I'm also thinking what else could happen? Like you and I like, you know, talk about VCon, you and I talk about maybe yeah. Comic-Con or for me, like even Sneaker Con, like there's these cons, these ideas. And I'm like, there has to be a better way or a different, well, not a better, yeah. wrong word, different. a different way to um, kind of use that idea of coffee tourism to bring people together into a city to host an event. Our, our friends at Espresso State of Mind do something similar to that. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of my other thoughts. Like, man, there's other opportunities. Yes, I 100% agree. And I think that's like getting into um, those things I, I feel like aren't talked about enough, actually. Yeah. Now, that, now that I think about it, um, yeah, it's crazy to think what tourism can do, not just for coffee shops not just for your local roaster but also for even you know the people that work at the coffee shops or even let alone um what that could do for the city or the town like mm -hmm. it's crazy the ripple effects and that's already once again like getting into a little bit of economics but i think um <laughs> this is crazy because it's something that we've talked about and something i think we still probably hold at the back of our minds is um <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy. Uh, our concept of bed and breakfasts. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, that's my that's my little folks, secret. But it's such yeah, a good one. It's yeah. it's a little secret. I mean, yeah. if you're listening this far into this episode, yeah. I think you deserve to to know this little gem. But yeah. Sergi and I have been thinking very yes. much about how we pair our enjoyment of Airbnb of that hospitality staying at a place um, and that whole experience. Once again. A lot of, I mean, if you've listened around our podcast, we're huge on the concept of experience mm -hmm. um, because it's not just, a lot of things are not just one single, um, single faceted, so to speak. Like yeah. when you're, even if you're buying a cup, uh, a coffee, a bag of coffee from a roaster, that there's a lot of experiences happening. Yeah. And so we've always talked about is how do we create, bring back the bed and breakfast kind of, 
And how do we actually have Mir both have a cafe or or just a roastery, one of them, but probably like a cafe and roastery. And then maybe like upstairs above have an Airbnb for people specifically traveling for maybe like, yeah, you know, either coffee things for coffee conferences or maybe you're just a traveler visiting Bellingham, but you love coffee. Why would you not stay above upstairs of a coffee roastery? Yeah. And then, you know, if you're staying there, you get, um, you know, through two free beverages a day, you get some breakfast, uh, all included in the stay of the Airbnb. And, um, you can even like, maybe like book, like some kind of like experience, um, event, maybe like a cupping. Yeah. Like that, that's insane. Like, yeah, come I, on. Like, there's so many possibilities for that. I mean, you and I have dreamed about this for a while now. Yes, so we yes. have a lot of ideas around this, but even even going back to the idea of like we always talk about traveling to origin. Mm -hmm. Like what if we created a plan where we have producers and farmers visiting the folks who drink their coffee, right? But right. also pairing that with the idea of like giving them a break, like yeah. completely spoiling a producer and being like, yo, we've been doing this for like 10 years together. Like let us like, I don't know, give you the best sheets on your bed. Let us uh, <laughs> like cook you the best meals. Let us, you know, you can have whatever, you can have whatever you have. We want to do this for you. And on top of that, like you get to just sit there in the corner of this cafe and just watch people. Like if you wanted to, of course, Yeah. just delight over all this hard work that you put in partnered yeah. with me. Yeah. I don't know. To me, that sounds, that sounds pretty dope. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a wrap, folks. <laughs> um, wow, lots and lots of thoughts on coffee tourism. Um, if you made it this far in the podcast, feel free to drop some comments below. Do you travel for coffee? What's that like for you? Do you specifically travel because of coffee? Or where do you sit on that side of the yeah. spectrum? Drop some comments down below um, on YouTube of your experiences. Hit us some, send us a message, send us an email, or even Spotify now has, you can actually comment on the oh, podcast, oh, which is kind of interesting. Rad. So that's another uh, little thing that you could do. But friends, also lastly, uh, make sure you uh, leave us a review, leave us some stars. If you've been listening to this on either, you know, Spotify, Apple podcast, give us a little, you know, if you like it, only if you like it, yeah. just give us a little, you know, so, some, some stars, yeah. some stars that helps a lot. Definitely. Uh, but other than that, thank you so much for joining in once again on, on another episode of the Coffee Roaster Warm Sessions podcast. And as we always say, reflect what's good.